As Pastor Jason makes his way up here, kiddos head out. All right, good morning. Good morning. Well, it seemed like I just seen most of y'all yesterday. Amen. Uh, so I hope y'all enjoyed as much as I did yesterday our Christmas showcase. I um, want to give them another round of applause for yesterday. Just a really good show yesterday. God was glorified. Um, so today, we're finally going to finish Luke 18 uh, with this uh, last block of Scripture, verses 35 through 43, uh, where, uh, as we mentioned last week, uh, Jesus is coming close to the end of his gospel ministry. He is making his way into Jerusalem. And so uh, as he goes there, he has to pass through Jericho first. So if you ever looked at a map of uh, first century uh, Judea, you see this travel going south as they go through Jericho and then they make their way up into Jerusalem. And he passes a blind beggar and we will explore today uh, just the significance of anytime Jesus is preaching or doing works, there's something in there for you and I from a spiritual and physical uh, standpoint. So if you are able to stand, we're going to read the word of God. Uh, again, Luke 18, uh, our last block here will be verses 35 through 43. Verse 35. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting on the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front of him rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came there, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that because of your death and resurrection, we who were lost are now found. We who are blind to our sin and our eternal state have now been given sight that we not only see the sinful state that we're in, but most important, we see a much greater Savior. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for your works and your persistence to go to the cross, that you died, that, may, that we may live. So we pray, Father, that you would help us to remember this truth as we go through your word today. We pray this prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So as I mentioned earlier, as we have been going through uh, Luke chapter 18, uh, Jesus' gospel ministry is coming to an end as he heads into Jerusalem. Now, as I mentioned last week, he is coming out of Galilee, where she did the bulk of his gospel ministry, and they're making their ascent up into Jerusalem after, in our last sermon last week, as he predicted his death and resurrection for the third time. So in verses 31 through 33 of Luke 18, we covered this last week, he says, see, we are going up into Jerusalem. And everything that is written by the Son of Man, by the prophets, will be accomplished. You know, we kind of did a, a slowdown survey of Isaiah 53 as a sample size of the prophets of the Old Testament that spoke of the coming Messiah and what he was going to do. And so Jesus says that everything is written by the Son of Man, by the prophets, will be accomplished, for he will be delivered over to, to the Gentiles. He will be mocked, shamefully treated, and spit upon. 
And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. So we covered that last week. And then we also understand that Jesus' final destination to Jerusalem had geographical, historical, and theological significance. We talked about the geographical where he's going to Judea, whereas Jerusalem sits almost 3,000 feet above sea level. Okay, and we also talked about the theological and historical significance of those things. Further, another thing that we should know before we get into the text about the blind beggar is the timing in which Jesus goes into Jerusalem. He is going to be there purposely at the Passover, at the Passover. Now, is there a coincidence in this timing? What is the significance of the Passover as it relates to Jerusalem? So for one minute, one Koreans, for one minute, y'all going to be my seminary students for one minute, okay? We're going to do an Old Testament survey, just a brief survey of the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, the first five books in the Old Testament are the books of Moses. We call them what? The Pentateuch. What's that? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? Now, in Exodus, which is probably my favorite uh, book uh, there, is you have where uh, Moses, you know, he is out with his fathers and laws, you know, goats and sheep and all these various things. And he happens to look over and he sees a bush that is burning, but it's not burning up. And so he goes near this bush to see what is going on. And here is where God encounters him, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob who says, I have heard the cries of my people who have been in bondage and slavery to Egypt and Pharaoh, and I have come to deliver them. And he looks at Moses and says, and I'm sending you. I'm sending you. And so one of the things that God did was through all this, that he did great signs and wonders and to include plagues, plagues. And so the last plague that, Jesus, that, uh, that, that God did was he administered judgment by bringing death on all the firstborn of Egypt. And in doing so, he would distinguish between God's people and the Egyptians. And you see this in Exodus chapter 12. And this is where he institutes what we call the Passover. Okay. And so, uh, and, so, uh, and so in Exodus chapter 12, God commands Moses to instruct all his people, that's each household, to kill a lamb without blemish, a male that is one year old, okay? And part of the lamb they would eat, and they would do it quickly. But the other part, they would take the blood, and they should put it on the doorposts and on the lintel of their front entrances of their houses, And then God says to Moses, he says, then at midnight hour that he would move through the camp, that he would come through and strike all the firstborn of Egypt. And so a little excerpt in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12 through 13, so you can hear for yourself. He says, God says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast and on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And God says, and then when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no place shall befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And one of the things you notice in this story is that that in this uh, provision for salvation, merit played no place. It played no place then. It plays no place now. Because remember, behind those blood-stained doors were sinners just like the Egyptians. But yet God makes provisions for his chosen people as an act of mercy. And the lamb was what we call a substitutionary atonement, a sacramental symbol that pointed forward to the future sacrifice of Christ. And so now the Passover festival was given to Israel to observe from generation to generation for once a year for a seven-day period. It was meant to commemorate this event, God's deliverance of his people from the bondage, the household of slavery out of Egypt. Okay? And so God, just like God instructed his people to kill a lamb as an atoning act, that lamb was a sacrifice in their place a substitutionary stand-in, so also Christ is our substitutionary atonement. Or as Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, he would say these words, for Christ our what? Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Or additionally, when Peter was teaching the church about the cost, what it costs God for you and I to be saved, he says our salvation was purchased with the precious blood of Christ. 
like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. First Peter chapter one, verse 19. And so Israel on that great day learned the great powerful works of God that only the blood of the lamb saves. And likewise, when you and I receive Jesus in faith, his blood washes our sins away. And when the father sees the blood on you, death passes over us. And so Jesus was a sacramental symbol pointing forward to these things. So now, it is by divine providence, right? We're going to fast forward back to our text. It's by divine providence that Jesus, our Passover lamb, approaches Jerusalem at this very moment. But however, before he and his band, the disciples, can begin their ascension up into Jerusalem, he must first pass through Jericho. And here he comes across a blind man begging on the side of the road. And one encounter with Jesus, this man is made whole. So today we will briefly explore the physical and spiritual implications of Jesus' works in his life. So verse 35 through 38, we're going to talk about what this whole title, the son of David, is that they call Jesus, that the blind beggar calls Jesus. You heard Brother Norm read Matthew 21. They called him the son of David. What is the significance of that? But first, I want you to picture the scene in which Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. Okay, remember the text, it says there are many traveling, not just Jesus. They all travel from all over to come into Jerusalem for the Passover. So the text says he's traveling with a crowd. Okay, he's traveling with a crowd. And so also when there are crowds coming to Jerusalem, this is an excellent time for beggars to be standing on long side of the road begging for alms because they're probably going to get a lot. There's a lot of people coming to Jerusalem. So I want you to picture that. Okay, um, and so. Also, when you look at uh, the beggar of our focus text, the Bible makes a distinction. It says that he is blind. He is blind. So he cannot see Jesus. But he could hear and he could decipher the talk about him in the crowd. Further, another note I want us to grab hold to this foundation to help us understand this text is that further we should remember that Jesus' teaching, his miracles, his signs, and his wonders were known. He was famous all over Judea and Galilee. They would have known. So it's highly likely that this blind beggar that's on the side of the road, he would have heard of Jesus before. And so the text confirms that the, uh, the, uh, the text says is that that he confirmed with the crowd that this is truly Jesus of Nazareth. OK, and when he finds out that this is who it is, he wastes no time getting his attention. He does not care how he looks or he sounds. He needs him right now while God is near. And so he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. That sounds like a cry for pity that is only can be addressed to God alone. To God alone. You see a sample of this in David's life. So, for example, in Psalm 4, chapter 1, David says, says, God, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief in my distress. Be gracious to my prayers. The blind beggar sought God's mercy and trusted that he would answer his plea. As he approaches Jesus, he recognizes him as God. Now I go back to this title, Son of David. Now in Israel's history, they understood the designation of the Son of David, right? They understand that designation was synonymous with Messiah. And what does Messiah mean? It means the anointed one of God. They understood this. You know, further... Okay, these Pharisees and the scribes, you know, they remember they got indignant when this title was given to Jesus. You know, remember Brother Norman just read here earlier, you know, Jesus, you know, he comes into Jerusalem just before he gets crucified. The Bible, the, the Bible titles it the triumphal entry. He comes in on the donkey's coat. That was prophesied too that the Messiah would, the king of glory would come in on the donkey's coat. And when he comes in, who is he met with? A crowd of people, a line in a row, worship him, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. And the Bible says that the Pharisees and the scribes, you know, they feel some kind of way about that. This whole son of David, him getting worshiped like this. But Jesus responds to their indignation. And what he simply does, he quotes Psalm 8, verse 2. He quotes David. You know, in Psalm 82, David, what he's doing, he is worshiping the majestic name of God. And so when the Pharisees and scribes feel some kind of way of Jesus being called son of David, Jesus quotes 
Psalm 8 and 2, where David says, Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have ordained praise. Praise. And even in the Luke gospel, who captures his triumphal entry, right? You know, Jesus tells, you know, the disciples, the Pharisees and scribes, who tells the disciples to stop this worshiping of Jesus from happening, calling him the son of David. And what does Jesus say to him? He says in uh, Luke 19 and 4, he said, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The very stones would cry out. And it's a marvelous thing that even Peter captures in his letter that you and I as Christians, we become what? Living stones. But I ain't got time to get into that right now. We'll leave that for another sermon some down, down the road. And so the blind beggar, he cries out for Jesus. And we see his persistence pays off in verse 39. But the text says he got a problem. He's got the crowd. They're trying to hush him. But yet he persists all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, there's a few theories among biblical scholars as to why they're trying to shush the blind beggar from speaking. So, you know, there's some that believe that the crowd was in a hurry to get Jerusalem and they did not want Jesus holding up the caravan of pilgrims to attend to this blind beggar. Because remember, Jesus is often seen with the crowd, right? And one thing you learn in the gospel, his gospel ministry is that those crowds did not move quickly when Jesus was concerned. You know, there's a part of the gospel uh, where, you know, Jesus is going off to heal another man's daughter, right? That she is sick and ill. He's on his way. But he is, the crowd is moving so slow with him, a woman with a flow of blood comes up and catches She had a flow of blood for 12 years. And she catches him because he's moving that slow. Okay? So, you know, obviously some think that because they know if he stopped, everybody's stopping. Because they're going to see what Jesus is going to do. Now, there are some that believe that Jesus probably was teaching. You see that in his gospel ministry, that he's often walking and teaching as he goes along. Maybe they didn't want his teaching interrupted. Who knows? Now, there are some, it's also plausible, that they, they uh, some plausible, they think that they didn't deem, the reason why they're trying to hush the blind beggar, because they didn't deem him worthy of Jesus' attention. They want him to be quiet. He's not worthy. We see the same attitude in the disciples, right, when they're trying to hurry the children away in early Luke 18. Remember we talked about that? Childlike faith. They wouldn't even let the children come to him so that they may receive a blessing. Who knows? But for whatever the reason may be, here's what the text reveals. That the blind beggar, he cast off all pretension. And his needs to be dignified. He didn't get himself together. He didn't think about, well, you know, maybe I need to sound a certain way. Uh, you know, he didn't care how he sounded and looked. He didn't say, well, you know, maybe if I can show Jesus a talent, maybe if I start singing, I'm blind. But maybe if I can offer him something, I can sing and dance or do something. This is a festive time. I can do all these things and maybe I will be worthy for Jesus to hear me. But that's not what he does. That's not how faith leads him. The Bible says he shouted. He called out in the name, he calls on the name of the Lord out of his what? Unworthiness. Unworthiness. Because the primary man, he had had a time clock on it. He wanted to draw near to God while he was near. He realized that if help was to come from God, it will be by and through the son of David. The son of David. And so he does not allow other people to stop him from calling upon him. He lets no one persuade him otherwise. He becomes like the persistent widow. Remember the parable of the persistent widow? We went over that. The first block of Luke 18. He becomes like her who, who continues to come to this wicked judge regardless of his indifference, regardless of the continual denials of justice. She keeps coming and wears him out until he answers. He becomes like her where he, his faith calls him to persist. He doesn't take no for an answer. He disregards other rebukes to stop crying out for Jesus. And so what you see playing out as we get into this last couple of verses, 40 through 43, we see a biblical principle there where God rewards diligent seekers. He rewards diligent seekers. Now, remember I mentioned before that Jesus had a reputation of not only being powerful in miracles, signs, and wonders, but he also had a reputation for being compassionate compassionate. See, he was unlike the religious elites of his day, like the Pharisees and scribes. Unlike them, he showed, blind, he showed compassion to the blind, to the lame, to the lepers, to the outcasts of society. He was seen fellowshipping with Tascalus, actually made one one of his own disciples. 
He was seen fellowshipping. He was a friend of sinners. They witnessed him interceding on behalf of a prostitute whom a mob was preparing to carry out her death sentence in the Gospel of John chapter 8. He intercedes on her behalf. He didn't say that she didn't deserve to be stoned by the laws of Moses. He said, ye who without sin cast the first stone. Because it's only one that's righteous standing there. And his name is Jesus Christ. This was known throughout the region. He valued children. As I mentioned, even to the point of rebuking his own disciples from hindering them from coming to him. He even showed pity to Gentiles. You know, I mentioned this before many times. Remember the sorrowful Phoenician woman of Mark 7 who comes to him, comes to him pleading for his daughter, for her daughter, who is possessed by a demon, and her daughter is made well. He declared a truth that was so powerful because, remember, Jesus was often seen in the synagogues preaching the gospel. He declared a truth so powerful they recognized that he did not teach God's word like the scribes did, but he taught with authority with authority as his words or his own, as the word of God. He was like a physician who drew near sick people. He was like a good shepherd who was concerned with the one sheep that lost his way. That even though there's a hundred of them, it's unacceptable to him that one will be lost. All hundred must be accounted for. He will leave the 99 to go and save the one. And all these stories all these things he did, his fame, all these things spread throughout the whole region of Judea and Galilee. And this, my friends, is what the blind beggar had faith in. These are the things that would have been heard. And so remember, even Jesus likened himself to a physician when he says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke chapter 5, verse 31 through 32. And so it was people like the blind beggar whom Jesus' heart went out to. And despite those in the crowd's efforts to silence and hinder the blind man, Jesus hears him and he stops. He stops. And so he asks him, he has him brought before him, he says, what do you want me to do for you? Now remember, Jesus was fully God and fully man. Fully God and fully man. He already knew what the blind man wanted. Want it, but he instructs him to ask for, anyway, what do you want me to do for you? Why? Because remember what Jesus said about himself and the Father. He said, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. And just as a heavenly Father is well acquainted with the needs of his children, so also Jesus could perceive these needs while he was in the earth. Further, to ask of God is to also enter into fellowship with him, two things are needed, humility and neediness. We come to him in our unworthiness, our unworthiness. We're not like to be like the children of Israel or like some of us today do, where they saw earthly provision in other places and people to include strange foreign gods, which God had to remind them that, remind them, he says that I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Psalm 81 and 10. Because God is a cure to our many afflictions. And he achieves this end through personal relationship, fellowship, discipleship with him. Right? Not sure. Jesus can heal us of our physical sicknesses. And he does. But remember, in this life, especially in this season, we'll get sick again. All right? We'll get sick again. Sure, he can raise us from the dead like he did Lazarus in John chapter 11. But in this life, we're still going to perish from it. Even Lazarus still died from his earthly life. But it's in our fellowship with God through faith in Jesus Christ that transcends this life into eternity. Into eternity. And so the blind beggar, he makes his request that he might regain his sight. Jesus responds. He says, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. He says, your faith has made you well. Now, in our culture, we got a lot of people twisting around what that means to have faith. Okay? I ain't got time to get into the heresies I hear going in the culture about, you know, telling people, well, the reason why you're not here because you don't have faith. That's not what Jesus means when he says that your faith has made you well. 
then what does he mean? First, you have to remember where faith actually comes from. You and I can't just conjure it up. We can't just conjure it up. It does not exist in our human condition. But Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 is that faith is what? A gift from God. A gift from God. Further, we can see that the blind man had faith working in him before his healing. What do you think caused him to cry out to Jesus while God was near? What do you think him caused him to persist even though those those trying to shush him? He's not listening to them because he's not there for them. He came to speak to Jesus and he's going to call on him and tell him because he believes if God would just hear him, all will be well with him. So he persists. And remember the Bible says that God diligently rewards those who seek him. Jesus makes the blind beggar whole. And so Jesus does restore his sight. He is physically healed. But Jesus does something far more important than that. He grants him salvation. Salvation. He is eternally healed. And how do we know this? Because what does the text say? The text says immediately he recovered his sight and he followed him. Glorified God. Now, when you look in the Greek, that word followed The meaning behind that whole thing means that it means that he is a company. He goes after, he obeys, and implies discipleship. Discipleship. The same word there followed that you see here in the text is the same word used with the disciples. For example, in Luke chapter 5, when uh, when Levi, the tax collector, got up to follow Jesus, the word follow, same word here. Discipleship. He gets up and he follows Jesus, glorifying God. And so when the people witness Jesus' works in the blind beggar's life, they also glorify God. Why? Because Jesus' singular motivation, his singular motivation for doing everything that he did in his three years of doing God's work was what? Was to glorify his Father. Glorify his Father. And so as we think about this text, it's not very much a long text, but what does it, you know, I've gave you some breadcrumbs of things that you should be gleaning, you should be pulling for your own walk in life, but what are some things specifically that can help us walk with Jesus? Because this walking with Jesus is not simply that we're coming to Jesus, but those in Jesus, how do we grow? How do we continue to seek him? Grace didn't stop the day we got saved, but you and I need almost even more grace to walk with Jesus because the war that's going on within us, because we got the old man, the old sin nature that's in there that's been overthrown by the spirit. But it is is, uh, hatching an insurrection. It's trying to take back over, but it has no more power. But you have the new creation that you are, and we have to be reminded that grace is abounding. We have to be reminded that we must still seek God while he is near. So how does this passage apply to us? A few things I want you all to think about as we close. Number one, we are to come to Jesus for all our needs. That's both physical and spiritual. You know, I've been in some circles sometimes where you got some folks in Christian circles that, you know, for them, it's in their minds, it's all spiritual and all this stuff like that. And, you know, you don't need to pray to God about those physical things and the stuff like that. Don't worry about those things. You just pray and believe and God just going to do it. Yes, we do pray and believe. But God has called us to pray for our spiritual and physical needs. And you see this in the gospel ministry. Just look at Jesus. He cared for both. He didn't simply just say that I am the bread of life that has come down for heaven to give you life, to sustain you. But he looked at the multitude that was with him and he looks at his disciples and he says these words. These people have been with us too many days. If we send them away like this, they will faint along the way. They're going to faint from hunger. He said, no, we're going to feed them. He gave them their physical provision that they needed. If God didn't care about physical needs, then this passage to the blind beggar, we you take it out and throw it out. He didn't say just believe in me, be safe. He said, but let me help you regain your sight. Your faith in me has recovered your sight. So we are to come to Jesus for all our needs, both physical and spiritual. Yes, God prioritizes spiritual over physical. Yes, he does, but they are important to him. And we ought to ask God for everything we need. We ought to be like this blind beggar. He came to Jesus. Number two, God hears our prayers and acts 
God hears our prayers and he acts within our lives according to his will. That's one thing that we're all growing and maturing, that we pray according to the will of God. 1 John 5, according to the will of God. And he says that, that if we pray according to the will of God, we have what? This confidence that he hears and he will answer according to his will. We're all growing in that. We don't always pray according to the will of God. And sometimes we're not really even sure. But we pray anyway. We pray anyway. Because even in our prayers, Jesus says, Paul talks about how the Spirit has to pray on our behalf. It's got to clean up. These prayers, and it prays for us in the perfect will of the Father, in the perfect will. So we pray anyway. But God hears us, and he acts within our lives according to his will. Because remember, anytime God is moving in our lives, the end product of any answer to our prayers is for his glory. If if you're not getting no glory, that's a prayer that's not getting answered. He wants his glory. Sometimes, even in our life, sometimes God even gives us some things in our life that we really don't need because he know down the road we're going to see and repentance even glorifies God. Glorifies God. And so God hears our prayers and he acts within our lives according to his will. Number three, you see this in the blind beggar. We are to persist in our prayers through all obstacles. Persist because there are many. There are many. One of the biggest spiritual discipline struggles in all of Christendom is prayer. Is prayer. You know, matter of fact, a lot of us, we would rather serve than pray. Because if we're serving, we can put our hands to something, we feel productive, and we can actually see something happening. But see, when we go to prayer, we're praying before a God whom we do not see. But we must believe that he exists, and he hears us, and he is there. Prayer is much harder. But We must, the blind beggar is a picture of our prayer life, that the blind beggar's faith overcame the hurdles meant to frustrate his seeking God. Because sometimes there are people in our life that will discourage or interrupt our prayer time. I tell you what, you know, when I get ready to sit down to pray, I don't know about you, you know, I could be doing everything else, I could be on the phone, but when I go in my closet and I get ready to start praying, here they come, knocking at the door, you know, hit the the phone, I got to put the phone upstairs somewhere. You know, and then sometimes it's not outward things, but even when you get silence in there, your mind is roaming. There are things going on to the day, but you stay there and you pray and you let the Spirit calm you. And you say, you even pray for that. You pray for God to calm you and set you and have you focus on Him for this time that you're going to be with Him. Because remember, you know, and I remember we both, we have two natures, the sinful nature and Christ's nature. It should not be a surprise that when you decide you're going to pray or you're going to read your Bible, your flesh ain't interested. We won't have nothing to do with it. You know, we shouldn't, you know, when you sit down and read the Word, hear people say, well, you know, I start getting sleepy. Don't be surprised by that because the flesh and Satan has no desire for spiritual things. For spiritual things. But guess what? You and I call, you sit there with that Bible open, you need to get yourself a cup of coffee, get a cup of coffee. I mean, we, when we, it's something we want to do, or we're going to make every provision to make sure we're awake and alert to do it. But how much more should we give that for God? You know, God has provided everything we need for righteousness that we may seek him, that we seek him. You know, and we may not be, you know, sitting there as, you know, Reading the Bible and be all strong in the very beginning. But, you know, our spiritual life is a muscle, too. It must be worked on. There must be a routine and a reputation. And it must be built up. You, know, you got folks, I see them in the gym, they all physically strong. But in the spirit, they anorexic. There is no spiritual strength at all. But we have to work on those things. We must persist and do, don't feel no kind of way about have being dull in front of the world. You keep praying and you stay there until God continues taking. And the more and more you do it, here's what's going to happen. The more and more you do it, it's not that you're just going to have change in there, but your desires for God will begin to grow. And here's what's going to start happening. After a while, some of your earthly affections is going to start to wane. People are going to start to notice it. My wife used to tell me, she said, well, I don't see you watching as much football. And I said, I have to be honest, I'm just not as interested. I can't even sit and pay attention to it as long. But I used to be a sport junkie. My two oldest know that. My point is that 
I still got a long way to go. You got a long way to go. But the only way you and I are going to draw closer to God, we must pursue him. We must work in it every day and we will get stronger. So like the blind beggar, we ought to persist in our prayers through all obstacles. The last thing is very important. You hear me say this before because sometimes we do feel like we watch other people, how they pray, or we look at somebody else's life. Man, that's, that person, she seemed to be so spiritual and all these types of things. No! You know, the Bible tells us not to compare ourselves one to another. Everyone's at different places. Some are, you know, newer in Christ. Some are older. Even from seasoned saints, there's some areas that still got babe written all on it. That still need some work. So while we are to model Christ for each other, it's important that you are going to God for yourself. Give little thought to appearances and style points when it comes to prayer. Little, appearance, little, little thought to that. The blind beggar didn't care. You know, the woman who had the full blood between us, she didn't care. You know, I talked about that before in that sermon, whatnot, where that she, he's a rabbi. She's, un, she's considered by the laws of Moses unclean. She's not even supposed to touch him, but yet she reaches out and she touches him. And Jesus don't feel no kind of way about it. He just wants to have her say that she's been healed so he can receive the glory. He can receive the glory. Her faith has made her well. So we should give no thought about appearances and style points when it comes to prayer. Remember, Jesus, when he taught about prayer to the disciples, he said, don't be like the Pharisees and scribes. Don't be like them. Okay, God doesn't desire these ritualistic, long, empty phrase prayers. You can have a long prayer, but remember, you're talking to God. You're talking to God. He wants us to pray with earnest and from the heart and with transparency. If we're going to have a long prayer, make sure that it is meaningful. You know, you think about it. You know, we don't talk to people that way. I don't go in front of John and go, oh, and I start reading off a script and stuff like that. They'll be looking at me like, what are you doing? I'm standing right here. Why can't we just have a conversation? That's what you're doing in prayer with God. Have a conversation. And when it's, you're done talking, stop talking. Pray. Be there in his presence. We talked about, again, I keep going to Luke 18, past sermons. Remember the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector? Remember we went through that? And they go into the temple to pray? Who, who walked out the temple justified? The tax collector. Because the Bible said he didn't give this long, self-righteous, really, 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 uh, probably ritualistic prayer that the Pharisee probably always gave before God. I'm great and all these various things. I can't even repeat it without getting a little disgusted with it. Okay? But the tax collector, the Bible says he barely looks his, his eyes to heaven. But he beats his breast and says, Lord, have mercy. Oh, me a sinner. That's how we go before God. We don't need any style points, but we pray with earnest and from the heart. Why? Because God already knows what you have need of before you ask, before you ask him. He already knows. But he wants to hear you say it because that fosters relationship with him. Sometimes, a lot of times we keeping things in, but you know how it feels sometimes when you just get it out? It's just out there. Now, your situation ain't changed. You're like, man, that, I feel good. I got that off my chest. We do that with people. How much more should we do it with God? Because remember, the burdens that you and I are carrying, there's only one that can really carry it. And it's Jesus. Come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Bring those burdens to Jesus. Because remember, coming with a bunch of flowing words, flattering God is a fruitless campaign in prayer. Fruitless campaign. And I must admit, my early days sometimes, because I heard someone else pray that way, I prayed that way in prayer. You ever had God interrupt your prayer? Okay. I heard an interruption. He says, what are you talking about? Stop praying that way. I love God. Because even in those moments, he's there loving because he wants to have meaningful relationship with you. And so God desires fellowship through discipleship with his people. The blind beggar follows Jesus. But we have to remember, we have in our culture, even our church, church culture, there are many who want God's stuff with no attachment to him. They desire the provision and not the provider. They long and lust for the gifts, but not the giver. And so true healing is simply not a matter of present physical affirmities, but true healing, but true healing is granted to the one who follows Jesus. 
That's where true healing comes in. And such a person who has received, such a person who has received Jesus has also received the most powerful active ingredient in our salvation. That is our faith. That is our faith. Because it is a faith that calls on him in the day of our trouble. It is a faith that depends solely on him for life and future. It is a faith that makes us well. And so let us come to Jesus for that type of faith. Let us come to Jesus. So the melodies of my favorite hymn in the hymn book is that it is well with my soul that you and I can sing that hymn in our hearts every day because we've got to be reminded because we so quickly forget God's graces. But we'll be reminded when we go to him that we have a faith that makes us well. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're graceful, you're gracious, and you're merciful. That you have wiped away our transgressions, that you've cast our sins as far as the east to the west, that you are merciful upon us. We thank you, Father, that you sent your Son, that through the laws of Moses, what was revealed is that we could not obey your commands. We could not keep all the law. And even if we would boast and say that we kept all the law but one, if we break one part of the law, that means your word says we've broken it all. But that you knew before the creation of the world that we could not keep it. So instead of the law that was given to identify sin, the law that condemns us, you send your son who came with grace and truth. And that he has sacrificed himself, that he is our Passover lamb. That he hears and he sees us. And only by faith in him can we live. Can we grab hold to what's most important, our eternal salvation. That we inherit the promises of an eternal future. That though we live today and we have your spirit, we have many struggles and all this, and that a day will come where all the sin and the corruptions of our flesh will be put away. And that we will have a new body. And that we will worship you day and night. And we will serve you in the new creation. We thank you, Heavenly Father, though we don't always live a life of worship, but that you are patient with us, you work in us, that we will grow in that area. Because We've come to know that you are preparing us for our future where we will worship you endlessly in heaven. And so, Lord, we pray, Father, that you would help us to be encouraged with this record, this story of the blind beggar. That you hear us, that you see us, and that everything we need in this life is found in you. We pray this prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.